Charlotte Kay. I am a psychotherapist and a researcher. And I myself am a recovered addict as well. My addiction in terms of a chemical substance was food. Certain foods, I, if I eat them, I can't stop eating them. Like, I go off. My life became consumed with going to the grocery store or going to the app and ordering the food. And that was how I spent three, five years of my life um, to the point that I, I probably shouldn't be alive right now. Through working the 12 steps and through eating in a particular way that works for the way that my body works, um, I was able to put the food down and different way of thinking about mental health, I think as a clinician as well. A body image is the way that we see ourselves. We have an idea of our, in our mind of what we look like. We have an idea when we look in the mirror of what that means, of how other people perceive it. Uh, in fact, we have one of our sort of senses is proprioception, our body in space. You know, my hand is right here and I know that because of proprioception. This is my sense of my physical body. Why do people develop a poor body image? It's very multifaceted. So for some people, it's, look, they had incredibly positive parents. They had a lovely upbringing. They were sheltered from negative media, and yet they still grow up to have negative body image because maybe there's some kind of genetic, biological precursor. Maybe there was an incident of trauma that happened to them. Um, it's very individual and unique and personal. It's experiences we have maybe at school or with our friends. Um, certainly, not to vilify the media, but there, there does tend to sometimes in some spheres be unrealistic expectations. And the expectations are not even realistic for the individuals who represent, you know, think of a model who's airbrushed and she'll say, I don't even look like that. Um, for young people, that can be really hard because it's that age when everything's concrete. So it's hard to hold that in mind. And certainly now with social media, apps that you can change the, the width and the length and you know, clear your skin up and whiten your teeth and um, you know, people bringing their phones to sessions and saying, I wish I looked like this. That's a filter, you know, that's not real life. So I think in a lot of ways, young people have a, have a harder time. So poor body image is probably pretty common. <laughs> it's probably an epidemic um, nowadays. And body dysmorphia is a clinical disorder and it is on the obsessive compulsive disorder spectrum. So it's characterized by obsessive thoughts. Body dysmorphic disorder significantly impairs an individual's life and their ability to function and their, their happiness and their well-being. In some individuals, there may be something there that they're seeing and they really kind of zoom in on it and they exaggerate it and they focus on it at the expense of many other things in their life that require their attention. Um, and that can go as far as having many surgeries, really, you know, getting ever more obsessive about this thing. Um, an, an unfortunate example that we can look at is perhaps Michael Jackson, where as you watch the transformation of like rhinoplasty one to the final one, um, one, whether or not that was what actually happened, I don't have his medical records, but that would be, if he had BDD, that would be a really good example that maybe the first time he went in, just like any of us might go in if we're unhappy with our nose and no judgment. Um, I've had my nose done, <laughs> so genuinely no judgment. Um, but if I then wanted to go back and have my nose done again, because actually, and I have these thoughts, right? Like I'm like, my nose is still a bit too bulbous, but I'm not going to go back to the wonderful plastic surgeon who is who is genuinely very good. And I could say to him, can you make this a bit smaller? That could go on forever, right? With someone who has BDD, it really could go on forever. And, and it would be devastating. They would really spend their life doing that. And then of course there's the BDD 
that I think we're probably all more familiar with, which is within the context of eating disorders, individuals who maybe look at their body and it's not what they want it to be. But is it, right? It, where's the reality there? Are they looking in the mirror and they, are they genuinely seeing a reflection of what they look like? Are they comparing themselves to something that's attainable? Um, with someone who has BDD, it differs from poor body image because they actually don't see themselves. What they're seeing in the mirror or on the phone is a, is a bit of a delusion. It's an, obsess an obsessive delusion. Um, they don't see their bodies. Anorexia is a really devastating example of this, that um, women who are so underweight, they're at risk of death, can still find areas that they feel they need to lose weight. The best way to treat it is by seeking help from a professional. And at this point, I think the research indicates that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, has been effective at treating body dysmorphia. Um, also, perhaps medication might be useful. Um, it tends to be what we call comorbid, which is to say that it's probably co-occurring with other things that are going on, and addressing those things can be helpful. There's a lot of things that people can do to develop a better sense of self and self-esteem around the way that they look. And the easiest way is just to try to maybe be a bit kinder in the way that we speak to ourselves. This is a kind of mindfulness practice. If you notice yourself thinking, ugh, cue in negative self-talk, you can meet that with, actually, I look beautiful, right? Or actually, I love that part of myself. That makes me unique. So that's one thing we can do. Another thing, um, a little trickier and a little harder because it is very human to adorn ourselves and to want to look good and to feel confident is to try to come to a place of acceptance or neutrality around the body. And again, this is sort of a mindfulness practice as well. The way that I look does not make me a better or worse person. And I can understand that's a tricky one. I think that is almost one might say like the next level after we come to a place of maybe being a bit gentler with ourselves, um, can we actually just let it go? But ultimately, I think if we can make representation more representative, genuinely representative of all of us, I think that the, the reality and the truth that human bodies are inherently beautiful and amazing, that will start shining through. It will be the cultural agreement that bodies are beautiful because bodies are life, because bodies are everything. It's an instrument. Life is not meant to be lived perfecting, fixing, completing our journeys and mental health, that it just gets deeper. And maybe we get a little bit more honest and we surrender a little bit more, and then we discover there's a whole new layer. And so I think the, the beauty is to first destigmatize all of this because it's just the journey of being human and we, we've all got something. None of us, not one of us, has perfect mental health.